Um, back today for another hour of the Philadelphia Green Power Wellness Show. Our guest we're waiting for on the call is Gordon Edwards uh, from Canada, and he is on with us. Uh, I'm going to start right in with our guest, Gordon. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Usually I start off with a little discussion on my own of nuclear power, but you are, uh, as far as I can tell, Canada's leading expert. On nuclear power, we do stuff all the time. You're terrific, um, and unfortunately, um, I, we're going to have to start with the bad news. I usually like to start a little upbeat, but um, uh, the truly terrifying news uh, from Fukushima. Uh, I posted a piece, um, a, a progressive magazine, on August 8th. Uh, it's made the rounds of uh, uh, Common Dreams, um, Reader Supported News, a, a few other the websites, uh, FreePress.org. Um, and uh, you, of course, have been talking about what's happening in Fukushima. It is not a pretty picture. Um, and so I, I think I'll let you, if you don't mind, jump in and explain the latest developments to our horrified, terrified, and deeply saddened listeners. So jump right in, Gordon, and give us a, give us a shot here of what's going on there. Okay, Harvey. Well, um, as, as your listeners may or may not understand, uh, a nuclear reactor can't really be shut off. Um, even after the reaction itself is stopped, that is the chain reaction, the radioactivity that has been created during the chain reaction uh, lasts for millions of years, but it continues to generate an awful lot of heat uh, for the first uh, 10 or 20 years. And uh, when they take the fuel out of the reactor, or whether it's in the reactor or out of the reactor, it has to be actively cooled for at least seven years before uh, before it is uh, put into dry storage, because otherwise, if it's not continuously cooled, it will overheat. And when it overheats, it's going to give off radioactive material into the environment and into the atmosphere, as well as into the soil. So this is a problem with the Fukushima reactors. Even though they melted down two and a half years ago, TEPCO still has to pump water into the melted cores of those reactors every single day um, and try and pump it back out again and store it above ground. They've got thousands of tanks that they've built above ground, and they're running out of space. They even had to cut down a small forest in order to make more room for these tanks, above ground tanks, that they're using to hold the contaminated water. Well, well pump- Gordon, let me, let me clarify one thing here. Uh, at Fukushima on March 11, 2011, we had, um, well, we have, of course, a major incident in the, and in the, uh, with, with a tsunami and a, an earthquake. And in the wake of that, uh, we had at least three meltdowns. That's correct. And you, and you, you have just explained that these cores, the melted cores have to be cooled. But we don't even know where these cores are, do we? No, that's, I mean, that, that's a really amazing situation. That's correct. And uh, what's happening is that uh, how far these cores have penetrated through the floor of the reactor building or not is really unknown because the radiation levels are so intense that not only can humans not go in there, no, there's no humans have been able to get close to these melted cores. The radioactivity is too intense. But even robots that they've sent in there, the, the gamma radiation is so intense that it fries the electronic components after a few minutes. And so the robots are of only very limited use for a short time. Uh, the result is that they just don't know what the state is. But we believe that the molten core has melted through the bottom of the containment vessel. It's onto the floor, and it's probably uh, either melted through the floor or is in the process of melting through the floor. The fact that and this is time three. This is not just one. Way. This is unit one, two, and three. That's correct. That's units one, two, and three. Now, some of those units are perhaps in a worse condition than others. Uh, unit one seems to be the one that melted down first, although we can't be 100% sure even of that. Uh, but in, in the case of unit one, there was an addition to the loss of power. You see, what, what happens with the loss of power is that you lose the circulation of the water. When you lose the circulation of the water, even though the reaction is shut off and the chain reaction is stopped, the radioactivity alone is enough to drive the temperature higher and higher until it melts at a temperature of above 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's what happened to all three of those cores. Now, do case, we know, uh, Gordon Edwards, do we know, are there, is there any um, blob of corium, because that's what we call the core once it melts, it's corium, uh, that is still at 5,000 degrees, is it centigrade or Fahrenheit? 
It would be fa- that would be Fahrenheit. I'm using Fahrenheit yeah. because I assume most of your listeners are American. Uh, so yeah, it's so about 2,800 degrees Celsius. Is there any? Do we know? Is there anything? Uh, any of the corium um, at Fukushima still at 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit? Well, it's it's conceivable there is. Uh, it's it's impossible to know for sure because you see, um, when there's a difference between heat and temperature, which people don't always understand. Temperature is how hot something is, but heat is a form of energy. And if you're adding energy, if you're adding heat, then if that heat cannot escape, if there's no way for the heat to be removed then the temperature will go up and up and up. There's no limit to how high the temperature can go if the heat uh, isn't removed. Now, the heat can be removed by various ways, by conduction, by convection, by uh, active cooling. Uh, it's possible that uh, inside, the, inside the core, inside the corium, the melted mass, there could be pockets of, uh, of uh, corium which are still in a molten state. We don't know that for sure. And this is two and a half years later. Now, we did have a bad indicator um, uh, this year in that some steam has been you know, observed uh, 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 on the site, and that would be an indicator that we still have super hot material at Fukushima. Is that correct? That's right. And, in fact, there's been several incidents of steam escaping, and uh, nobody quite understands what's going on because, again, it, it, we're playing a game of blind man's bluff. Again, people should remember that at Three Mile Island, when the 1979 accident occurred, it was only a partial core meltdown there, but it was six years before anybody could take a look at it. It was six years before they could take the, the lid off the reactor and actually look down into it and see just the, the extent of the damage. Yeah, and the, um, the core at Three Mile Island, the, the, the structure at Three Mile Island uh, was nowhere near as wrecked. Uh, I mean, as it is at Fukushima, there was, thank God, we were on the brink of an explosion at, 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 at Three Mile Island, which never, thankfully, happened. Uh, the, the certainly the elements where there was plenty of hydrogen around, which could have exploded. Well, there were hydrogen really explosions. Yeah, there were there were a couple of hydrogen explosions at Three Mile Island, but not uh, powerful enough to blow the uh, the machinery to kingdom come. Right, and that's what's happened at Fukushima times three, possibly even times four. I mean, we've had major yeah. damage in Unit Four as well. Nobody knows. There's no agreement on exactly how the damage happened at Unit Four. The uh, the the reactor was shut, thankfully, at the time of the tsunami and, and earthquake. Um, but uh, there's been a very substantial structural damage at Unit Four. Terrific structural is, damage. Yeah. Now, uh, what they've discovered uh, recently, Harvey, as you understand probably, is that uh, is that. While TEPCO has been pumping water into the molten cores and trying to pump it back out again and store it on the surface, there is at the same time an underground river of groundwater which is coming down from the high ground behind the plant and running underground through the damaged reactor buildings, right through the molten core area, uh, core uh, of the reactors, and flushing out those radioactive materials and carrying them through underground toward the sea, and this has been going into the sea at the rate of uh, at least 300 tons per day. That's about that's about 80,000 gallons a day, or 3,300 gallons per hour. Um, and this stuff is is very radioactive. It's it's intensely radioactive, and it contains uh, um, a mixture of all those fission products, all those radioactive byproducts that have been produced by the fission process, and that's been going into the sea. Uh, probably ever since the accident occurred two and a half right. years ago. And, they, and they, TEPCO has not talked about this. It, it's really just, shall we say, surfaced in the media, uh-huh. that this huge river. I mean, there is, my understanding also, is there's an aquifer under Fukushima. Oh, there, there is, absolutely, yeah. It's never been discussed. I'm sure it's totally contaminated. It has to be con- totally contaminated. Well, it is. It is. In <laughs> fact, they've... They have these trenches that they built around the reactor. They have numerous trenches. Some of these trenches were used to carry cables. Some of these trenches were used to carry pipes. But in these trenches uh, around Unit 2 and Unit 1, they have found levels of cesium-134. Now, the cesium-134 is radioactive, one form of radioactive cesium. The permissible level of this is supposed to be 60 becquerels per liter. Now, a becquerel is one disintegration per second. 
So 60 becquerels per liter is the maximum permissible in water. They measured 750 million becquerels per liter in the water in those trenches. And for cesium-137, where the permissible level is 90 becquerels per liter, um, they've measured 1.7 billion becquerels per liter. So these trenches, uh, the, the levels of contamination are extremely high. Yeah, I mean, in, 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 a, in a real world um, uh, where we don't have this kind of disaster, nobody should be anywhere near that site. And, you no, know, that's for sure. It's kind well, of the workers. There, there was recently a story, just a, just a, a, a matter of uh, less than 12 or so hours ago, where 10 workers were sprayed with water, presumably to cool them off or to wash the dust off them, and the water itself was so radioactive that now those those ten workers are, are going to be, have to be submitted to body scans to find out what kind of internal contamination they might have experienced. So once the water is contaminated, you have the drinking water, you have the water that you wash with, you have even the water you wash the clothes with. Everything becomes suspect, and uh, water, of course, is the lifeblood of living organisms. You know, it's uh, you could think of the aquifers and the rivers as being like the bloodstream of the living of the world of living things. And once that's contaminated, you're really in trouble. Yes, and you know they're telling us that the Pacific Ocean is so large it's not going to you know it'll it'll um, diffuse all this stuff, and it's absolute nonsense and we we have strontium 90 we have cesium 134 cesium 137 iodine 131 these these all have half lives in the 30 year range and there, there are plenty of other some of them do and uh, go ahead you're going to correct yeah well iodine 131 uh is only got a half life of eight days however iodine 129 which has the same characteristics as iodine 131 has a half life of 17 million years so again, you have a wide variety of materials. Um, there's other materials like the the so-called actinides, plutonium and americium and curium, which typically have half lives in the tens of thousands of years. So once these things are disseminated into the environment, they become part of the food chain. And uh, because uh, we uh, have grown, because we have evolved in a in a um, an environment where the level of radioactivity was relatively constant all the way along, our bodies do not have any mechanisms for determining radioactivity. So the bodies of fish, the bodies of other animals, um, they just treat this stuff as if it's food, and they store it up in their bodies, and, of course, it goes up and magnifies as it goes up the food chain in the case of some of these materials, such as cesium, because cesium is regarded by the body as if it's a, a valuable nutrient and uh, so it, uh, they've, they found fish, for example, that have 2,000 times the permissible levels, the so-called permissible levels, which are really the maximum contam contamination levels of uh, radioactivity. They found fish with 2,000 times that amount in their flesh right in the harbor near Fukushima. And, of course, our own Federal uh, uh, Food and Drug Administration ceased um, uh, testing Pacific fish in the wake of the F Fukushima action, you would think that any sane society would uh, vastly escalate the testing of, of fish coming out of the Pacific Ocean. But our FDA, I don't know about the Canadian one, but our FDA stopped uh, testing uh, fish uh, after Fukushima. I, I mean, it's, it's staggering that they did this. And, of course, our president got on national television uh, within a week of the accident and said the radiation was not going to come here, and, and when he was on TV saying it, it had already come here uh, and by airborne. In, fa in fact, radiation from Chernobyl got to the United States within two weeks. It was very, very uh, substantially detectable, uh, as has been the stuff from Fukushima. But our federal government, I'm not sure about the Canadian one, Gordon Edwards, is... Yeah. is, is no, they, they've also it. stopped monitoring. They've also it, stopped monitoring. It, it's the... It's not only a non-scientific, but it's an anti-scientific point of view. You would think that, you know, if you really wanted to find out the effects of radioactivity on the food chain, you would pull out all the stops in studying and measuring every last detail in order to, to learn. But um, w the government seem to be more interested in turning a blind eye to it. They're more interested in public relations than they are in protection or well, even in, or even in learning. Or industry. That's right. They're protecting the nuclear industry rather than the population. Now, in fact, this is what the Diet of Japan found when they hired, uh, they commissioned a, uh, 
a panel of experts to write a report on the causes of the Fukushima accident, and they determined that the Fukushima accident was largely a man-made disaster due to collusion between the industry and the regulator and the government because they were more concerned about promoting the good image of nuclear power and the public relations aspects of the situation rather than protecting people or the environment. You know, I don't know if we could ever get a report like that out of the United States, frankly, that was so frank. I'm glad to hear that the Japanese at least faced up to the reality. Well, uh, some are and some aren't. The difficulty is that the nuclear industry is uh, almost like the medieval church, you know. It, it's, an, it's a state within a state, and uh, they run their own affairs with very minimal uh, or no interference from the governments, respectively, and this is one of the problems. You know, our elected officials, um, they don't deal with these uh, questions, uh, even though they're life-and-death issues, uh, to a sufficient degree. Um, the result is that the nuclear industry is basically largely a self-regulating industry, both in the United States and in Canada. The regulators are captives of the nuclear industry. They, they are staffed by the people who come from the nuclear industry, and they have very similar attitudes to those in the nuclear industry. And the idea is to, um, whatever you do, don't stop nuclear power. Just try and expand it, uh, taking precautions as you go along, but don't let anything stop you. And that's really right. the attitude of the International Atomic Energy Agency as well. Most people don't realize, if you read the, the mandate of the International Atomic Energy Agency, their mandate is to expand nuclear power. Right. Now, the IAEA, which you've mentioned, the International Atomic Energy is a body of agency, is a body of the United Nations. Now, their, their mandate, as you say, is to both, so well, they don't really have regulatory power. They are out there to promote the nuclear power industry. In the United States, we had the Atomic Energy Commission. The Atomic Energy Commission was charged with both regulating and promoting the nuclear power industry, but in the 70s, uh, the anti-nuclear movement rose up and demanded uh, that there, were, there would be an independent regulator, so we wound up with uh, the Energy Resource and Development Agency and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission was supposed to be an independent regulator, but Gordon, as you've mentioned, the, the regulators have been captured by the industry. We have, uh, ironically, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission staff in the United States, the, the middle and lower ranking um, officials, are generally pretty professional. It's yeah, the, 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 it's the commissioners themselves that are corrupted. We have, we have some really horrible commissioners. We've had some terrible ones. We just had a, a, a guy who was the chair of the commission, uh, Gregory Jas Jasko, and he was actually pretty good. And they got, of course, they got rid of him. We now well, as a matter of fact, Jasko, Jasko, after he was um, um, replaced uh, as the chairman of the National Nuclear Regulatory Commission, he even said that uh, there is a fundamental problem with all the nuclear reactors that are operating in the United States, and they should all be phased out. Because yes, the problem right. is, the one that I identified earlier, the fact is that with a complete loss of power, which however that's brought about, whether it's brought about by warfare, whether it's brought about by natural disaster, whether it's brought about by sabotage, if you have a complete loss of on-site and off-site power, you have a catastrophe. Uh, because those Fukushima reactors, when you see the enormous damage that's been done to the buildings that you described earlier, that's not damage from the earthquake or from the tsunami. That's self-inflicted damage by the reactors themselves. All you got to do is cut off the power, both on-site and off-site power, and the same thing would happen with other reactors around the world. Yeah, it's horrifying. We're talking with Gordon Edwards. Gordon is, the, as far as I'm concerned, the leading expert on nuclear power in Canada, one of the world's truly most knowledgeable people uh, of all about nuclear power. I read everything he, read, uh, he writes. Uh, Gordon, if you'll identify yourself with a, uh, a book or a uh, website uh, that you'd like people to go to, uh, please right. do. Yeah, the Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility was formed uh, about 40 years ago, and we have a website which is ccnr, Charles Charles Norman Roger, um, dot org. So ccnr.org, okay. and it's got uh, things both on uh, weapons and on plutonium and on reactor safety, on uranium mining, on radiation effects, uh, on isotope production, all these things. Now, do you have a, uh, a title associated with this organization, Gordon? I'm the president of the Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility. Okay, and you are the leading um, organization in Canada on nuclear power. 
and or against nuclear power. And um, uh, I watch all your stuff. I just watched you on TV uh, talking about Fukushima. The reason we're talking about Fukushima today, uh, folks, here at the Solar Tobia Green Power Wellness Show, is a shocking revelation has come, which has probably been hidden for two, more than two years. Uh, which is that massive, massive quantities of radioactive contaminated water have been pouring in uh, uh, to uh, the Pacific Ocean. Uh, this is not this is not inconsequential stuff. Not only are they massive quantities of liquids, but they are very highly contaminated. You know, we've heard a lot about tritium, which has an eight-day half-life, but and, uh, and generally the public has been led to believe that the effluent from uh, the Fukushima site has been largely tritium, which um, is serious, but with an eight-day half-life, you're not going to take it too seriously. But no, no, now, excuse me. Just a correction. Tritium has a 12.3-year half-life, so it's okay, dangerous good. for about 100 years or so at least. You know, it's, it, We're talking about centuries for tritium. We're talking about uh, m probably a millennium or so for uh, strontium and cesium, and we're talking about uh, basically hundreds of thousands of years for things like plutonium. The tritium, uh, I guess they confused it with I-131, which has an eight-day half-life. That's, That's right. right. That's right. Okay. So, tritium, uh, is, tritium is a rather different uh, substance. Uh, it's an insidious substance. On the one hand, the industry regards it as one of the least dangerous radioactive materials because it gives off a very weak beta particle when it, when it disintegrates. When, when radioactive materials disintegrate, they give off subatomic shrapnel. Uh, in the form of particles and gamma rays, but tritium does not give off any gamma radiation. It only gives off a low energy beta particle. But the problem with tritium, the problem with tritium is it's exactly like ordinary hydrogen. It's radioactive hydrogen. And hydrogen is the, ba not only the basis for water, H2O, but it's also the basis for all the organic molecules in living things. So that tritium, radioactive hydrogen, gets incorporated right into DNA molecules and into all the other organic molecules in your body. And because of its strategic location in these molecules, the damage that it can do is extraordinary. Well, Thomas Gordon Edwards said, um, uh, you know, the Pacific Ocean is really big. And uh, this is coming into the Pacific Ocean, yeah. of course. Although, uh, I guess they have a bay there uh, outside of Fukushima. Um, uh, is there a danger to the west coast of Canada and the United States from the effluent uh, coming from Fukushima into the ocean? Well, there, there, there is, and there, there is, but it, one doesn't want to exaggerate it too much because the ocean is enormous, and uh, the, the even the tonnage of, uh, of uh, living material in the ocean is enormous. But the fact of the matter is that. You know, when we think about uh, putting something into the ocean, we think of it dispersing and diluting and getting weaker and weaker just as a result of mixing with all those huge volumes of water. But living organisms go around and they gather this stuff up and they reconcentrate it in their bodies. And so the fish and the other living organisms uh, are the ones who are collecting and absorbing this material. Typically, you will see concentrations in algae, for example, or seaweed, which are tens or even hundreds of thousands of times higher, the concentrations of radioactive materials in those th materials are ten to hundred thousand times higher than they are in the water itself. Then you have organisms which eat those other organisms and they concentrate it even further in their flesh. So the result is that as you go up the food chain, these, uh, these living organisms become carriers for the radioactive materials and concentrators of the radioactive materials. And the result is that uh, over a period of time, as the fish get older, they eat more and more of this material, and the concentrations get larger and larger in their bodies. So one would expect that fish near the Japanese coast, for example, if they, if they, if they don't swim too far away from the Japanese coast, they're probably going to be getting more and more concentration in their flesh as the time goes by. Uh, even, even though the accident itself were contained, suppose there was no effluent going into the ocean, there still is enough in there already that, uh, that they're going to be gathering it up for years to come. Well, we have, um, I believe it was cesium that was found in uh, tuna uh, yeah. off the coast of California, and the cesium was traced to Fukushima, is that credible? Yes, that is credible. Now, so, now what the, 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 where the real debate comes in here is, is how life-threatening is it? 
the, fa- the fact of the matter is that at low levels of exposure, and this is why, uh, why there's a lot of controversy, at low levels of exposure to radioactivity, people do not get immediately sick. For this reason, Rosalie Bertel wrote a book called No Immediate Danger, and she, it was an ironic title. Because the fact is, there is no immediate danger. You're not going to kill over dead, just like people do not kill over dead from smoking a cigarette. Like one of the reasons why the dangers of cigarettes were went unnoticed for such a long time is that the people who smoked cigarettes looked like they were having a good time. They seemed healthy. They seemed beautiful. And uh, it's only when 10, 20, 30 years later that they die of lung cancer and emphysema and heart disease and strokes. And unless you follow the medical records, you don't even see the damage that's being done microscopically. Well, it's the same thing with radioactivity. The damage that is done is done at a microscopic and a cellular level, and it takes biological reproduction of those cells that turns into cancer and other types of diseases. Uh, and of course, the, uh, the al- analogy um, goes a little beyond that, uh, Gordon Edwards. Uh, my understanding is that actually some of the damage that comes from most cigarettes because they use phosphates in the in the um, yeah. uh, fertilization of tobacco, actually is radioactive. Then, well, indeed, in fact, the American Health Society, which is the society that actually works for the nuclear industry mostly, the American uh, Health Physics Society, which is the, uh, the these are the people who work at the nuclear plants and so on, they have said that up to ninety percent of the deaths attributed to cigarette smoking are actually due to radioactivity in the tobacco in the form of a substance called polonium-210. And this polonium-210 is what causes uh, most of the cancer and also causes most of the heart disease that is experienced by smokers. So, um, Right, and briefly, uh, polonium-210 is, my understanding, is an alpha emitter. It emits particles that's that right. are uh, two, two neutrons and two uh, protons, which that's is like correct. a giant cannonball. Uh, yeah. And once it's inside your lung, uh, your chances of getting cancer are about 100%. Depending so, on the levels. Good? Now, the, the levels in cigarette smoke are extremely small. They're extremely minute. But uh, polonium-210, I mean, really, I don't know. <laughs> this is a little bit off topic, but maybe not. Because polonium-210 was the was the material that was used to murder Alexander Litvinenko in London, England, by putting a little bit in his tea. If people may remember, he died over a period of about 30 days, excruciating death. Uh, from uh, right. drinking uh, radioactively contaminated tea, it was murder. Well, which many people, unfortunately, will be uh, experiencing over over a long period of time uh, with the uh, emissions from Fukushima. We're talking with Gordon Edwards, uh, uh, one of the leading experts, uh, the leading expert on nuclear power in Canada. I've got him on because uh, we have uh, terrible revelations. I've got an article at the Progressive Magazine and other websites, Common Dreams, around the web about uh, the latest revelations of massive quantities of radioactive liquid flowing through the Fukushima site. We're going to take a three-minute break here, Gordon, um, uh, near the uh, same song from Dana Lyons on Solotopia. Uh, back after a few, um, thank you, Dana Lyons, of Cows with Guns fame for the uh, that Rocky Top version of the Solotopia song. Talking with Gordon Edwards, the leading expert in nuclear power from Canada about recent horrifying developments. At Fukushima, I, I got to tell you, this stuff makes me physically ill when I write about it. When I read it, it it's just uh, I, 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 my problem is that I spent a week, uh, two weeks, uh, ten days. I don't remember exactly. At, in Central Pennsylvania, a year after the accident, investigating the claim that, that no one was killed there, and by God, uh, it's the biggest lie told in American industrial history. There were many, 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 many people killed at Three Mile Island from the radiation. Afterwards, I interviewed. The families, uh, we took uh, our own uh, uh, epidemiological test. Anybody tells you no one was killed at Three Mile Island, they are telling a horrible lie. Uh, Gordon Edwards, uh, let's very quickly, I uh, want to run through the mechanics, a little bit of Fukushima. Um, uh, Unit 1, uh, which exploded, of course, uh, was General Electric designed. Uh, units 2 and 3, were they also designed by General Electric? Well, basically it was the same design, although some of them were built by a Japanese company. They were still the American design that was used. They were all the American and what, design. And they and all had the spent fuel pull high up uh, so that uh, uh, the, the worry with unit number 4 is that even though there was no fuel in the core of the reactor, there's a spent fuel pool very precariously perched up about five floors and if the plant were to collapse, which is in showing signs of doing, 
uh, then that fuel would be uh, all over the place, and it would be impossible to cool, and that would be a real... Uh, you, you could get far greater emissions than we did initially. Well, tell us what would happen exactly if the, um, uh, as best we can guess, it's never happened, thankfully. And tell us what would happen if the uh, spent fuel pool at Unit 4 did come tumbling down. Now, as you say, uh, was there no core? Was there no fuel in the core or was it just shut down? There was no fuel in the core at all. All the fuel had been taken out and put into the spent fuel pool. Nevertheless, the emissions from Unit 4 were uh, among the highest from all four reactors, and the reason for that was because of the spent fuel pool. Um, okay, so, uh, I mean, it's surreal to describe this, but we have a spent fuel pool, which must weigh many, 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 many tons, my understanding is we have about 1,300 tons of fuel. Is that about right? Uh, yeah, that's about right. Fuel. And the difficulty is that you, they can't even lift that fuel out of the pool because the structure has been so damaged that the cranes have been destroyed that are usually used to lift the material. So they have to build a, a whole new infrastructure over the top of the damaged reactor building in order to support a crane that will be able to lift the fuel out of the pool, it can't be lifted out without its own cooling system. So you have to have special casks that have their own cooling system. Otherwise, that fuel will, uh, again, overheat in the air and will release radioactive materials into the air. And, so, and the genius, it's a real the problem. Genius, so They're not I even going to the, start moving the fuel out of the pool for another year or so. If they figure out how. And we don't even if they to figure out how, that. that's right. But it's never been done before. No. And uh, the uh, part of the problem is that the spent fuel rods, now these rods are, uh, what are they, about 100 feet long? I'm, I'm not, not that long. Um, and and they're the, the size of, uh, I guess, your thumb, I suppose, and they're in... Um, well, they're in assemblies, yeah. though, and these assemblies are larger. These assemblies are sort of like two-by-fours, you might say. And uh, they have to be, but when they're lifted out, they have to be supplied with their own system of cooling water circulating through the, through the cast that lifts them out. And you also have to have a place to put them. So where are you going to put this stuff? Right. And the, the, the fuel is clad in zirconium alloy, which right. will catch fire when it's exposed to air. How these geniuses built a nuclear um, of fuel rods and chose zirconium to clad them is, is staggeringly stupid. Uh, well, zirconium know. is, uh, the, the, the reason why they choose certain materials like zirconium is because of the neutron economy, because in order to get the maximum uh, benefit uh, in terms of electricity out of the fuel, you, you want to make sure you have a material that doesn't absorb too many neutrons. Neutrons are what make the whole fission process work. Uh, so they choose neutron. They chose zirconium for that reason. However, zirconium, as you say, is uh, notoriously flammable at uh, higher temperatures, and um, you can have a zirconium fire, which w w which is far more intense than an ordinary fire. If if you if people well, some people may remember the old flash cubes that used to be used on cameras. And uh, it would make a brilliant flash at the moment that you press the shutter to take the picture. Well, what made that brilliant flash was little shavings of zirconium in the uh, in the fuel in the uh, the flash cubes. So it's been well known from day one that zirconium is is highly flammable, and it gives off a very bright energetic uh, uh, combustion when uh, when ignited. Now. Right. Uh, well, yeah, and, 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 and so what happens is that if the zirconium, if the fuel bundles are exposed to air in uh, in the pool, suppose the water were to drain out of the pool for one reason or another, then you would have the possibility of the temperature rising to the point where the zirconium would actually catch fire, and you'd have a very energetic fire in the pool, and this would just loft all kinds of radioactive material into the atmosphere. Uh, it would clearly be the largest radiation in the history of the world. I mean, uh, we have had... I think this was actually a year ago. It's been quite a while, quite many months ago. Uh, at least one Japanese scientist estimated that between 20 and 30 times more radiation has been released at Fukushima than was released at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And, 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 it, and the, God forbid uh, one of these spent fuel pools uh, would be exposed to air. Uh, we, we can't even begin to calculate uh, uh, how much radiation will be released into the air. And, of course, it would be pitched pretty seriously high and to be up by the fire. Is that correct? 
Yes, that's right. Now, actually, <laughs> higher in some ways may be better, but it goes further. That's the problem. Like at Chernobyl, they had a they had a a very intense fire, and what that does is that lofts the radioactivity higher into the air, which means it spreads over a much larger area. And so the result is that even in England, the sheep farmers in northern England, uh, for 20 years after the Chernobyl accident, they couldn't sell their sheep, uh, their 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 lamb meat, and their mutton. Uh, for human consumption without having very careful testing of the cesium levels in the sheep meat. And that was a result of Chernobyl, so that's thousands of kilometers away. Yeah, um, and, um, of course, it did came, it also came to the northern tier of North America, well, north of uh, about, um, uh, well, I think north of central Ohio, uh, across, uh, it, hit, it definitely hit Chicago, I'm sure a blanket at Canada. The, uh, the fallout from Chernobyl. Well, it was measurable in the flesh of the uh, Arctic uh, caribou and in the flesh eaters, the uh, Inuit, uh, who eat yeah. a lot of caribou. Uh, you could really see a spike in their uh, levels of cesium, cesium, radioactive cesium in their food and also in their bodies. And also in the milk in New England. That's and, correct. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the, the month after Chernobyl, this would be uh, May of 1986, uh, there was a 60% drop in bird births in the Point Reyes station uh, north of San Francisco. And the guy, the the, um, the ranger, the park ranger, who it was keep, had been keeping the record of birth births, bird births at Point Reyes for 10 years. And then in, in May, uh, the spring of 86, he recorded a 60% drop, and the response of the park service was to fire him. Mm. You know, there have been rainstorms come down and brought the radiation from Chernobyl down on these birds in New England, California. The park ranger, you know, just doing his job, reported the bird deaths and they fired him. We're talking with Gordon Edwards, of, uh, one, yeah. leading, one of the leading experts on radiation and health and nuclear power in Canada. Gordon, what is your, what is your website again? Uh, ccnr.org. Uh, Okay, um, uh, so Gordon, um, we we not we certainly could talk many many yeah. more hours. About I just want to say that. one more thing about Please. the uh, the underground leakage, this underground river that we talked about flowing through. The problem the problem with this is that they don't really know how to stop it. They built a barrier, but the water just piles up behind the barrier. It's an underground barrier, and uh, either the water is going to go around the ends of the barrier or it's going to go over the top of the barrier. And what has happened is the water level has climbed under the ground, and now it's gone over the top of the barrier. So that uh, they really don't know how to stop this flow because it's a major aquifer. And one of the plans that they are talking about is freezing, making a kind of a, a, um, a surrounding, a ring of frozen ground, like a wall of ice around the uh, entire four reactors. That would be about uh, a mile we're talking about a mile of, of a wall of ice, a mile long, to act as a barrier to prevent the groundwater from going into the cores of these uh, damaged reactors in order to try and solve the problem. But this is, of course, not only does it uh, sound like a crazy science fiction idea, it's going to cost a ton of money, and it's going to cost an awful lot of energy just to keep that ground frozen, and nobody knows if it's actually going to work. In fact, some of the experts in Japan have said that by diverting the groundwater around the sides of the building, you may weaken the soil to the point where the buildings themselves topple, and that could be a far worse problem. So well, they're really, they're all... they, they really don't know what they're doing. They literally don't know what they're doing. And you just quoted um, uh, Dale Klein, a former U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commissioner, who was uh, hired to come out there and, and um, um, to Japan and consult. And he went public with a statement to TEPCO saying, quote, you don't know what you're doing. And Precisely. Now he, uh, yes. And uh, even, he the head, that, even the head of the new Japanese regulatory agency has said this is a real emergency and that uh, the TEPCO company has no sense of crisis. And as a result, uh, the government of Japan has uh, said that they are going to take direct control, direct charge of uh, this problem of dealing with the, um, the gushing of this radioactive water into the Pacific Ocean. But there's no guarantee that the government of Japan is going to do any better than TEPCO at stopping it because it's a fundamental problem. Right, and sooner or later, the whole global community is going to have to step in 
this is a global problem, ladies and gentlemen. We're talking about uh, radioactive water pouring into the Pacific Ocean with extremely lethal isotopes, strontium, cesium, iodine, tritium, that, that kill people and, and, you know, that completely contaminate, contaminate all the, uh, of, of the living things in the ocean. Uh, the, the global community is going to have to step in. The global community has no better idea of what to do than TEPCO or the Japanese government, frankly. Well, I mean, that's right, and and if the Japanese government, this idea of having a global international task force to look at this has been suggested by myself and others from the very beginning of the Fukushima disaster, and the Japanese government has uh, strongly resisted all efforts to do that. But uh, it, it, I think it really requires uh, pressure from other countries to... Uh, say to Japan that this is not just a Japanese problem. This is a world problem. But the problem is, then uh, nobody has any answers. I mean, we, uh, does anybody outside of Japan know anybody, anything better than anybody inside well, Japan? I think, that you're gonna, I think that you're going to have a better chance of getting some reasonable ideas uh, if you have people who are not connected to the nuclear industry, not connected to the International Atomic Energy Agency, not connected to uh, governments that are promoting nuclear power even, uh, but that are just independent uh, p scientists looking at the problem as an environmental problem, not as a nuclear problem. And I think that you may get at least some good ideas. One idea that's been suggested is to build the wall above ground, not only below ground, but above ground, and uh, when the water pools up behind the wall, it will at least be uh, able, it, it will be possible to pump it into tankers that could come and carry it to uh, safe storage areas when I say safe storage areas, I just mean places where you can uh, keep it out of the environment of living things. Um, there are various things that could be done that are better than what are being done now. Well, of course, all those tankers are then going to become radioactive waste as well. They are. They yeah, are. The but guys who are running the tankers are going to be gonna have to wear radiation suits. And God you knows know, it, it's like them. The, it's like the reverse Midas touch. You know, King Midas, everything he touched turned to gold. In the case right. of nuclear waste, everything you everything nuclear waste touches turns to nuclear waste. Well, this is more like the Medusa touch. In fact, I know yeah, right. uh, not to get too obscure, there was a devastatingly um, uh, depressing movie which starring Richard Burton. I believe it was made in the early 60s called The Medusa Touch. And uh, this guy was a, a, a totally cursed piece of work. And the conclusion of that, well, I shouldn't ruin it for people, but it had to do with nuclear power. It had to do with wind scale. We're talking with Gordon Edwards, um, a leading uh, uh, expert on nuclear power from Canada. Um, uh, the incredibly depressing developments at Fukushima, very, very dangerous. Of course, the Japanese government, the new administration there, has been pushing to reopen the 48 reactors that are shut in Japan right now. There are 50 still operable. They managed to open two of them. Very, very political, very highly um, resisted by the Japanese public. I don't know if this, this administration uh, is continuing to push to open the other reactors in Japan in the light of this emergency of Fukushima. Uh, a couple of the, at least, at least a few of the other reactors were owned by TEPCO. And you had a situation before this broke where TEPCO was simultaneously, you know, doing their wonders at Fukushima while uh, attempting, uh, uh, politicking to open their other reactors. I mean, are you updated on what's, what's happened with that? Yeah, yeah. it's, it's uh, the worst kind of government we could have. Is a, it's a very right-wing government, very pro-nuclear, and uh, Abe is the prime minister, and he is determined to, uh, to open more of these reactors. Uh, one has to remember that there were 54 nuclear reactors operating at the time of the Fukushima disaster, providing 30% of Japan's electricity. So... For a while, they were all shut down, and uh, now there's only two of them operating, and they want to get more of them started up, the Japanese government. Um, but they are running into a lot of opposition. A very large majority of the Japanese public does not want to see the role of nuclear power expanded, but there is a softer number in terms of starting up some of the ones that already exist because of the economic repercussions. Um, however, the mayor of Hiroshima recently came out publicly attacking the prime minister for not taking a stronger stance against nuclear weapons. 
because the nuclear weapons question is a very hot issue in Japan as well. And with North Korea uh, having developed nuclear weapons and acting very belligerently most recently, the Japanese government is uh, beginning to soften its stance against nuclear weapons. So that's another concern as well. At any rate, we'll have to see what happens. But uh, I'm, I'm fairly uh, reassured that the Japanese population has a strong conviction that they do not want to see this industry um, continue in the uh, in anything like the guys that has been pre previously. Well, it's astounding to me that uh, anyone did in Japan would even consider reopening these reactors. Uh, they did get two reopened, as you say, after the uh, the four were lost at Fukushima, and then two more units five and six. Uh, uh, Japan had an even fifty reactors that were licensed to operate. They managed to get two of them back on, uh, but the other forty eight are still shut. But I can't imagine in, in, in any political situation. I spent time in Japan. I actually wrote about Japan, uh, about Fukushima in 1976, and an article published in, in uh, the Progressive that ma magazine that ma mentioned, yeah, this insanity that they were building reactors in earthquake zones uh, uh, washed over by tsunamis. This was not uh, a big surprise here. I mean, this was what could happen. Um, and yet, well, let, let me just let me just uh, point out, however, that yes, it's true that they were building reactors in a in a very dangerous area, and and you look at an astonishment and say, why were they so foolish as to build them in such a an earthquake prone area? But the whole of Japan is really sub subject to seismic activity of various kinds. Look at uh, even the mountain, you know, Mount Fuji is expected to erupt sometimes in the foreseeable future. Uh, because it, it, it erupted most recently about 300 years ago, and it appears that uh, it's ready to erupt now. There's many signs that it's getting ready to erupt. So uh, how many reactors are even within a 200-kilometer radius of Mount Fuji? There's a, at least a dozen. So there, there are, But we have to look at ourselves as well, because we in the United States and Canada, why have we built so many reactors around the Great Lakes? Um, think about the the problems they're having with the water right now at Fukushima. If such an accident were to happen around the Great Lakes, where would all that water be going? It'd be going right into the drinking water of 40 million people, which is right. uh, so. So uh, we're not so bright either in terms of where we're putting our reactors. And you look at, uh, for example, the Davis Bessie reactor uh, near Toledo, which uh, has the best of I've heard is four cracks in the containment. Um, almost got eaten through by, uh, I got very close. Incredible. Uh, yes, and uh, it goes on and on. Um, so, uh, uh, Gordon Edwards, um, with uh, the Canadian, um, uh, the largest of the Canadian anti-nuclear groups, uh, are you officially anti-nuclear, Gordon? Yes, uh, we are, but uh, we, we really have an educational role, and so instead of uh, trying to communicate an anti-nuclear message, what we try and do is educate people about the facts from a critical perspective, and we're convinced that when people learn the facts, they can make up their own minds. So uh, our, our, our general approach has been we assist communities, we assist researchers, we assist politicians to get good facts that they can build a case on, and to really come to grips with this issue. So we're more of a research. Uh, our mandate is basically to act as a clearinghouse for information for communities and uh, all those concerned about nuclear developments all across Canada. And give us your uh, URL for your website again. ccnr.org. Okay, now let's go back to Fukushima. I want to talk to you on another show. We're not going to get to it this time. We've only got five minutes left, so I want to really make sure we cover Fukushima. There is a debate going on about whether uh, what really caused the disaster of Fukushima. There are those who are arguing that Fukushima was doomed once the earthquake hit. Now, we had a 9.0 earthquake in the vicinity of Fukushima. It was actually 100 miles away. We have reactors in the uh, United States, uh, that, uh, at Diablo Canyon, for example, in California, at Indian Point in New York, that are very, very close to earthquake faults that are more than capable of delivering a 9.0 uh, uh, shock. And but then, of course, at Fukushima, we had the, the tsunami. How, in your understanding, how much of the disaster at Fukushima was caused by the quake, and then how much by the, the tsunami? 
Well, it depends upon how you analyze it. It's really, the tsunami, the main effect of the tsunami was to wipe out the backup electrical systems. So it means that you had, no, not only was the off-site power gone by the earthquake, that knocked out the grid, so you didn't have any off-site power. However, they have a lot of internal uh, standby generators, diesel generators and, and batteries and other things that can be used to generate electricity, to run the pumps, to keep the reactors cool for a period of time. Now, the tsunami wiped out those as well by shorting them out. So there was no power at all. And it was that total blackout that led to the overheating of the fuel because there was no circulation of the water. And because of the fuel overheating, the zirconium reacts with steam to produce hydrogen. When it reacts with steam, zirconium takes the hydrogen out of the uh, steam and release, uh, sorry, takes the oxygen out of the steam and releases hydrogen gas. And so that hydrogen gas that exploded and blew the roof off those reactors was actually a cause, were caused by the overheating of the nuclear fuel inside. Then so you really didn't the, have, it really didn't have anything to do with the tsunami. Uh, sorry? It, what, so what was the role of the tsunami? I mean, the role, of the, tsunami, the role of the tsunami was to wipe out the electrical supply that ran the pumps. And therefore, you see, the pumps, if the pumps were running, that would have prevented the fuel from overheating. But once the fuel had no, once the fuel was overheating because of no circulation of the water caused by no electricity, caused by the tsunami destroying the backup generators, um, then it was inevitable that these reactors were going to melt down. But, uh, at least a big but, how long would those generators have, rea have operated? That well, that's the whole point. Arnie Gunderson, Arnie Gunderson, who worked for 23 years in the nuclear industry, he says that, look, those reactors were doomed anyway because uh, those backup generators would only have provided power for a limited period of time. And then they would have run dry and you would have had the same problem. So even, even without the tsunami, if the um, the grid had not come back to uh, in, in uh, operation to supply electricity to Fukushima prior to the expiration of the ability of the backup batteries to provide power, this all could have happened without the tsunami. It could have happened without the tsunami. That's right. Uh, but you would have you would have had a little more time. You would have had maybe even a day or so to be able to react to try and get some kind of jury rig system of electricity supply. But they had no time at all. Once the once the tsunami came in, once the tsunami hit, they had no time. They were out of time already. The geniuses that built the Fukushima put the uh, you know they put the, the batteries in the basement. And, and, well, and that's is, true. That's true. Had they even diversified, as Arnie Gunderson, again, from Vermont, uh, who has uh, done some wonderful work on this, and I, uh, his Fairwinds uh, site is very good to look at. He's got a lot of videos that are very informative. But he points out that even if they had diversified where they put these uh, backup uh, generators, some of them higher up, some of them lower down, um, they would have had uh, some redundancy, you know. They would have been able to supply the electricity for a period of time at least. But, right, they, but they put them all in the basement. They put all their eggs in one basket, and they were gone uh, altogether. And we knew about this. Everybody knew that Fukushima was in a disaster zone, in an in earthquake zone. Hit that earthquake 100 miles away. God forbid that earthquake had hit, you know, 10 miles away. Uh, that place would have been rubberized. Uh, uh, listen, Gordon Edwards, I'm going to have to have you back. Uh, we've been talking with Gordon Edwards. Um, uh, we'll talk about next time about thorium reactors, small modular reactors. God forbid, hopefully there won't be any more bad news to talk about from Fukushima, but uh, that's what I have to ask for. Uh, we spent this well, hour, this whole time being on the show with Gordon Edwards. Thank you so much, Gordon, talking from Canada. Uh, you will be back with us, I hope, and talking about Fukushima. Uh, check out my article, if you would, please, uh, 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 about uh, what's happening in Fukushima. And uh, uh, let's just shut all these reactors down as soon as possible. Thank you, everybody, at PRN. This has been another Solartopia Green Power and Wellness Show. <laughs>